Good afternoon, everybody, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar towards a common European asylum system. Uh, we're delighted to be joined today by Nina Gregori, Executive Director of the EU Agency for Asylum. Uh, and thank you so much for your time today, Nina. We, you will all be able to join in the discussion during the questions and answers, which you can find on the Zoom. And you should feel free to send in questions during the presentation. Uh, I'd like you to maybe give your name and if possible, any affiliation that you might have. Um, I also will remind you that today's question, pre presentation and questions and answers are on the record and you are free to join our discussions on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Um, I'd now like to formally introduce Ms. Nina Gregori. Ms. Gregori has been actively involved in the development of and work of the EUAA since its beginning. She was a member of the agency's management board from 2015. And then in 2019, she took up her role as executive director. She's previously worked at the Ministry of the Interior in the Republic of Slovenia for over 20 years, occupying the senior management post of director general for over a decade, responsible for asylum, migration, integration, and internal administrative affairs. Ms. Gregori has also served as a national delegate in the expert working group migra migration at the OECD and as a member of the advisory board of International Center for Migration Policy Development. So you will see from her CV that she is very, very experienced and a very good person to have in charge of this agency, which of course, as you know, is based in Malta. Um, our discussions today will, will look at the development of the EU's common asylum system, uh, which has been un, un, undergoing for two decades. Back when in the late 90s, when I was minister, we were dealing with this issue as well. So it is an area that will continue to exercise us at a policy level. The new pact on migration and asylum was presented in 2020 to, as it were, jump start discussion of the reform of the CEAS and to build a comprehensive migration and asylum system. So Nina Gregori is going to spell out for us, paint a picture of developments and outline where policy stands at the moment, where countries are working together. And of course, it's a very relevant moment because of the geopolitical developments that has led to novel approaches. So I now would ask Nina Gregori to address the meeting and after which we will then have questions and answers. So Ms. Gregori, thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Nora. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is really a great pleasure for me to be with you virtually, of course, um, today for this discussion. And I'm really thankful to the International, uh, to the Institute for International and European Affairs here in Dublin uh, for this in kind invitation. I will uh, begin with a look at where we are coming from in the development when it comes to European uh, Union's common asylum system and the innovations envisaged in the new pact on migration and asylum. I will then try to turn to the actual implementation of the legislation, of, to the work of our asylum agency and the novelties that our new mandate has brought about. And uh, I will try to conclude with a brief, brief look into the future. Um, that's of course always difficult, but to the extent that this is possible. So if we start with common European asylum system, for more than 20 years, EU institutions and EU member states have been working to create, implement, and also improve, of course, the legislative framework on migration and asylum. So it, everything started back in 1999, so when the European Council committed to establish a common European asylum system, so a commitment made in the so-called Tampere program, which goal was also to set up the, uh, then in the treaty of the functioning of the European Union itself. So the first phase of this common European asylum system saw several legislative instruments adopted between 1999 and 2005, as Nora mentioned, which established directives with minimum standards on asylum procedures, on reception conditions, and qualification for protection. Since then, of course, efforts have continued in order to develop this system to achieve a greater level of convergence and also uniformity and unanimity among the member states. 
So these minimum standards established in the first phase were replaced then by common asylum and reception standards, while the Dublin regulation and Eurodac were also strengthened in the second phase of common European asylum legislation, which was um, completed back in 2013. However, the national implementation of asylum procedures and also reception conditions continued to vary from member states to member states quite significantly. There are various reasons for this, but let me pick on um, two broad ones. The first one is that the uh, directives of the EU legislation and legislative instruments allow, and they still allow this today, of course, for differences in how member states transpose them into their national legislation. And the second uh, point is that the legislation on its own is not, let's say, sufficient enough uh, to achieve convergence, of course. Uh, this is also about implementation and how the legislation is actually applied in practice. So, and this brought together, I would say, points became very, I would say, also painfully evident with the 2015 and 16 migration crisis leading to the presentation in 2016 of several new proposals to reform our common European asylum system. As always, as always when it comes to a sensitive area like migration and asylum, negotiations on those um, third generation proposals were um, not easy, not uh, least because of course most turned into directly applicable regulations, but for some of the proposals, not, negotiations pretty much stalled. For others, good progress was made, but they could not be finally adopted. So basically the third generation of CES, so Common European Asylum System, stayed on the table in Brussels because the number of member states, as well as the European Parliament, insisted on a package approach. So they've said nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So in order to address this situation, two years ago, uh, on the 23rd of September 2020, the new commission presented a new pact on migration and asylum, a in a way complementing and to some extent also replacing uh, the 2016 proposals that have never been adopted. So in this respect, we are still in the negotiation process of the common European asylum system as it should be um, or, or as it was presented by the Commission in 2020. So this new pact, um, and let's take a look at the key innovations, let's say, uh, that were introduced by the new pact on migration and asylum. Um, so the new pact aims to establish a comprehensive common framework to achieve more coherence and convergence in the asylum procedures. And also um, it tries to make procedures more effective while trying to strike, in a way, a fair balance between solidarity and responsibility. And we see this, for example, in the proposal to establish a screening procedure, which is, will um, also include identification and security checks of migrants, but also health and vulnerability checks. This proposal covers a lot of what member states already do in practice, but it aims also to achieve some uniformity in the checks um, of those uh, migrants who are arriving to Europe or will arrive to Europe irregularly uh, at the external borders. An important step forward with this proposal was uh, that this in fact um, tried to, as I said, uniform the, the actual implementation of the national legislation already. Um, so under the French presidency uh, in June this year, uh, the Council approved the negotiation mandate for this particular file, but now we are waiting um, if the European Parliament will also support that. Uh, the second impo very important act in the new proposal of the pact is so-called Eurodac proposal or amended Eurodac proposal, which would render the system of interoperability with other um, large-scale IT systems that are already existing in the field of justice and home affairs. It would finally give us a much clearer 
and really accurate picture of the number of asylum seekers in European Union, whether they receive protection, whether they were returned, whether they engage in a secondary movement and, and so on. So it does envisages, envisage also a separate category of persons brought ashore following search and rescue. And also this proposal um, in a way um, will try to um, fit in the registration of beneficiaries of temporary protections, such as now, uh, such as there are now Ukrainians. Uh, further on, the council negotiating mandate for the Eurodac regulation was approved also in June. And again, we are waiting now for the European Parliament to, to see how this will, will it be accepted by them. Then there is the Asylum Procedure Directive and the Qualification Directive that we already have, and they are, of course, valid. But um, in the new pact, those two were proposed to be replaced by regulations. So meaning that this would obviously make them directly applicable in the member states, and there will be no need for transposing them into the national legislation. But they are still pending as other proposals from the pact. And then I would say last but not least, the asylum and migration management um, regulation proposal. This is the proposal which would replace uh, the very known Dublin regulation. Uh, and this proposal also aims for a more coherent and holistic approach to asylum and migration with, let's say, a further better functioning system to identify the member states that are or should be responsible um, for, for the asylum application. But also it includes a proposal for a solidarity mechanism to allow for better sharing of the burden or of, of the migrants among member states. As you might imagine, this is, of course, the most complex proposal that it is in the pact. And also it is very complex when it comes to negotiations in finding this compromise between responsibility on one hand and solidarity on the other hand. In fact, as a part of the um, effort to balance those two, so responsibility and solidarity, um, in June uh, this year, a number of member states signed up to a political declaration on solidarity. So during the French presidency, um, the council approved the position on Eurodac and screening proposal and uh, 19 member states signed a declaration to provide uh, um, with a voluntary solidarity mechanism in the form of relocation or other types of contributions, particularly financial contributions to relieve, relieve the burden of the uh, member states in the Mediterranean. So now this, I would say, new voluntary mechanism is, is uh, set in place. And we will see whether the countries uh, will um, relocate asylum seekers, particularly from Italy and from, and from Greece. So negotiations um, on the new pact are now, of course, continuous. And for the only proposal which has been really successful and it has been adopted from this new pact is, in fact, the regulation um, for our agency, so the regulation for the establishment of the Agency for Asylum, or EUAA, as we are called now. Um, this regulation entered into force in January this year. So with this new regulation, our predecessor, European Asylum Support Office, so EASO, has become a new European Asylum Agency, so EUAA. And of course, um, with, with the, this replacement, we were happy because we've received let's say, additional um, uh, mandate that I will uh, touch upon uh, a bit uh, later in the presentation. So the actual implementation of the legislative framework that we do have in Europe with so-called common European asylum system is something that is, of course, crucial when it comes to the functionality of the system itself. And if we want to have a truly common application of common European asylum system across Europe, um, this needs to also function in practice, not only, of course, on paper. And uh, this is where, of course, our asylum agency plays a key role. And I will give you a brief overview of our work. So what do we really do 
to achieve, to help the member states achieve uh, the implementation of CES and also, of course, in a way to help them come closer together when it comes to convergence and the decision-making process uh, in the asylum field. So as its core, of course, our agency is a center of expertise on asylum and reception, and we have developed in our 10 years of existence guidance, common country of origin information, country guidance, data analysis, recommendations, so practical tools, operational standards and indicators, and so on. And all of those, let's say, practical tools or the tools that can be used by member states help member states and their officials in their daily work to actually apply the legislation and to do so in a similar way across EU. I will give you a few very, let's say, practical examples. For example, we have a practical guide on how to actually do the personal interview with the asylum seeker. And because of COVID, it create, created a lot of challenges for member states. In this respect, we also issued recommendations on remote personal interviews. So in this respect, if countries are using that, they do the procedures basically um, on, on the same foot, so equally. We have, of course, then practical tools related to access to the asylum procedure, guidance on the implementation of Dublin uh, registrations and uh, guidance on the examination on the asylum applications, guidance on reception, on how to assess vulnerability of the asylum seekers, how to basically conduct interviews with children. So a lot of tools that, in fact, are relevant when it comes to the procedural aspect of the, the, the CEAS. And addressing the emerging needs of member states in view of the arrivals of so many people from Ukraine. We have recently also issued practical recommendations on emergency placement in private accommodations for persons displaced um, from Ukraine, because we do believe that this is highly, highly relevant. We have also set up several thematic networks, which then brings member states experts together around one table to discuss the practices and to try to seek the best way or the best solutions that could potentially fit all. The new EOA mandate also generally broadens the scope for our development of such tools. So of course, I'm ha happy that at the end of the day, we will be able as European agency for asylum also monitor the operational and technical application of common European asylum system. As EASO, so as European Asylum Support Office, we didn't have the mandate to really monitor the implementation of the system, but now we will have that as European Asylum Agency, and this will be operational with, um, with the, from the 1st of January 2024 on. So now we are in the stage of preparation of the methodology for monitoring, and I think this is going to be highly relevant. So to bring countries closer together and to, in a way, mm, well, inviting to use our tools that we develop, we also have very strong training and professional development center, meaning that, of course, we are trying to, we are preparing the so-called training modules for all the officials on in all the member states that are working in asylum procedures. So we have more than 30 training modules that are available, both uh, that are so introductory and advanced ones, catering for specializations in member states officials, if this is, uh, if this, uh, is of course their, their need. We have had around 64,000 participations in our training since 2012. And we've trained really a lot of, of course, case workers, a lot of vulnerability experts, a lot of experts that are working in the field of, of asylum in, in member states. And now turning to our operation support, of course, this is something that has really grown exponentially. When I became executive director of the agency back in 2019, our agency was providing operational support to, to three member states. Uh, and we were in present in Greece, in Cyprus, and in Italy. But now, in 2022, we're operationally supporting 11 member states, and we are working with other member states with a view to supporting them too. So I'm really proud that I can say that we are now working um, not only just in frontline member states, but also in other member states of Europe that have asked us for support. 
So we are now operationally present in five Mediterranean countries. So we are present in Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Malta, Spain, and also in Latvia, Lithuania, in Belgium, in Netherlands, in Romania, and the Czech Republic. We are also now finalizing so the operation, operational plan with Bulgaria. In fact, I will sign it today. My Bulgarian counterparts already signed them. That and then with Slovenia and, and Austria, we are doing now the uh, analysis of our potential common, uh, common work there too. So this operational support basically uh, is based on the request from the member states. So we cannot invite ourselves, but we are invited. And then we do um, together the needs assessment and then the operating plan is prepared with some with the measures. And those measures, they of course uh, are different in different member states according to their needs. So we can cover information provisions, registration, asylum interviews, preparing opinions on the asylum applications. We support also the judiciary, so the second instance. Uh, we support reception authorities, identification, and also, as I said, referral of vulnerable people. So with uh, the situation in Ukraine, so with the war in Ukraine, um, the council invited us and gave us the mandate to be also active when it comes to the uh, so delivery of the temporary protection and the implementation of the temporary protection directive for Ukrainians. And we uh, do, of course, also help member states in this respect. We, we help them to register people. We help them with interpretation. We help them with finding accommodation for Ukrainians. And we are really active also, also in this respect. Um, so maybe just briefly to touch also um, to the position of Ireland, because I think that's quite interesting. Ireland had uh, opted in to EASA regulation, so the previous regulation, and Ireland has fully participated in the agency's activities. Um, I also need to say that we had the chair of our management board, which has been uh, our Irish colleagues for many years. That was uh, Dr. David Costello, and we've really cooperated with him excellently. So indeed, Iris was, uh, so Ireland was very active um, in, 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 the, in the agency before. Now with the EUA regulation that is replacing, of course, the EASA regulation, Ireland will uh, need to, in a way, um, if, of course, if there would be, a, let's say, decision, a political decision taken, will need to, in a way, opt in in the new regulation. And then I do hope that, of course, this good collaboration with, with Ireland will, will continue. And if I just can touch briefly um, and look into the future. So as we have learned in recent years, asylum and immigration can only be managed in a comprehensive EU-wide approach for which there is a shared responsibility for sure. In this context, of course, building a functional EU common asylum system is possible. And I really do think it's also necessary we should, in a way, strive to have short and effi efficient and effective asylum procedure. And of course, there is a big puzzle in the migration management uh, in Europe, not, not only in the member states, where, of course, also effective re return of those who are not eligible for asylum needs to, be, needs to be in place. So I think that with the temporary protection directive implementation, we see that Ukrainians of course, they, under the legal basis of the TPD, they have given the choice of where, um, so that they can move freely um, around Europe, which of course, asylum seekers can't. And I think that uh, this new approach on how really uh, Ukrainian situation and millions of people fleeing and receiving, let's say, protection in Europe will affect the current negotiations on the pact will be, will be highly relevant. I think that this, let's say, new approach now um, will affect the discussion uh, or the future discussion on the pact. I think that the, the member states are willing to apply the same solidarity principles during the crisis uh, as they shown for Ukrainian, or let's say the same approach will be also applied for other uh, asylum seekers that are coming from different parts of the world. So should we then think in terms of maybe in the future of mutual recognition 
of the free movement for all the asylum seekers, not only for Ukrainians. So are, I mean, there are so many, I would say, open questions that for sure will need to be addressed in the coming, in the coming uh, uh, years. Unfortunately, of course, I don't have a crystal ball and I cannot give you the answers to these questions because as you know, uh, we're not political organization and management migration in European Union is usually highly political. So, but I really do hope that Europe will drive from this um, extensive experience that we are facing now uh, in helping Ukrainians, you know, with the positive uh, insights. And this should be, let's say, uh, a positive game changer also for the future of our common European asylum system. Um, Nora, with that, I would give the floor back to you. And thank you very much. I hope I was not too long. Thank you.